Family mode. Good afternoon. Welcome to today's webinar. Uh, today we have facilities planning update. Our special guest speaker is Carl Thurnell. He's the director of facilities at uh, the State Education Department. Today we're going to go over um, A to Z of capital projects, necessary state aid forms, closeouts, current approval timelines, common errors to avoid, and more. If anyone has a question at any time during the webinar, please feel free to ask it. There's a couple ways you can do that. One is by using the question and answer screen, which is on your GoToWebinar control panel. Simply type in your question. That will notify me. I'll then uh, make sure you get an answer. Or you can feel free to use the chat window. I'll be monitoring that. And if anything comes up there, I'll, I'll break in and ask Carl to answer it for you. If you are connected via telephone and have typed in your audio pin and would like to talk to Carl, there is a uh, button that has a hand on it. That's called the raise your hand button. You can hit that. That will notify me you have a question. I will then unmute you and you can speak with Carl. So with those out of the way, any questions at any time, even about the instructions I just gave, please feel free to use the uh, chat window or um, send me an email. Um, so with that out of the way, Carl, the show is all yours. Okay, thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, as uh, Matt indicated, we're going to talk about uh, uh, what's going on in facilities planning today and uh, a little update on our process procedures where we are uh, in our review process. Uh, I'll just start out with a, with a brief uh, uh, report on where we are. Uh, I have four engineers. I'm unfortunately down to three architects after Mr. Tom Robert retired Oh, going on nine months ago. Um, I also am down uh, a project manager after Jeremy Ballum left. I'm looking to replace both of those, but uh, no luck yet. Um, additionally, Tony Frandino, an architect, is just back after three weeks uh, of recuperation after a little skiing accident. So uh, that unfortunately put us down to two architects for a, a significant period of time. So unfortunately, I believe our staffing is kind of close to the line, so to speak, as far as uh, the amount of work we have in the time frame that we want to get it done to help you folks as much as possible. Um, I also have Laura Saar back in facilities planning for oh, eight months now probably and uh, she has a helper Jasmina in order to manage the fire safety process and I have a final cost report auditor Desiree Ferguson. Hot topics these days. Um, there's a lot of school districts doing building consolidation. Um, we have a lot of questions on the application of our multi-year cost allowance. Uh, jurisdictional issues when leasing out school facilities is popular now because of the number of districts that have tried to consolidate within their districts. Emergency projects, $100,000 projects, and, and long-range planning. So very briefly, let me talk about school building construction, or consolidation rather. <clears throat> uh, within school districts um, is where most of the consolidation is going on because we have a poor track record this year of consolidation between the school districts or mergers. I think we're zero for six this 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 year, so that's not not such a great record. Uh, but as far as within buildings, we do have a, a significant number of districts that are trying to conserve local cost uh, by consolidating within school districts, and that's entirely appropriate in many cases because there has been a significant declining enrollment in many communities across the state. So with that, uh, school districts look to consolidate within their buildings, and uh, that's been very successful in some districts. It's also very controversial. As you certainly know, communities really get tied to their local school building, and if you need to close some, some building, that's fine as long as you close theirs, not mine type of uh, attitude. And uh, we do look at the aid very closely. And we need to see some resolution on the disposition of the building that's being closed. If it's going to remain open and available, then we're not going to be in a, in a position whereby we can assist with building aid. Uh, if you need to do additions and renovations to another building to accept the students from the closed building. 
Uh, we're not forcing districts to sell a building if they think that there could be a need for it in the future with a with a potential bump in enrollment or whatever the individual community's case might be, but we do see need, need to see that building taken offline and not available for use. And we're not talking about, you know, yes, you can leave the you know uh, gym open for adult volleyball and things like that. We're not so concerned about that. But if the bulk of the school is going to remain open, uh, then we're simply not going to be able to uh, provide building aid for a potential project on another building to accommodate those kids. Um, we also have, um, so as far as the consolidation, we, we do will, uh, pay building aid for reasonable additions if you're trying to consolidate, um, but we need to look at that in, in uh, conjunction with the appropriate long-range plan, which is the last bullet. So um, it obviously has to be well thought out. It has to be planned. You have to come to us with that justification of why you're doing what you're doing, and we'll do the best that we can to support the district in that effort. I will caution you that you need to take that long-range planning carefully, or take it very seriously, because we've had districts approach us and say, hey, we've got two buildings. We've decided to close building A, and they presented uh, the appropriate justification for that in our mind, and they uh, proceeded on a project, and we uh, agreed to pay building aid on that. Simply came to us a year later and said, we made a mistake. We should have closed the other building. And so now here's our plan to do that. And although we did help them, we did penalize them by the full amount of aid that we paid on the first building, uh, because that building basically uh, was only used for one year before it was then mothballed. So that's not a position the state can support. So we were able to help the district change their mind, but there was a cost associated with it that they had to uh, accept a significantly higher local share based on the fact that we didn't uh, reduce the amount of aid by the amount we spent on the first building the year before. Um, let's talk about application for the multi-year cost allowance for a few moments. Uh, this has been implemented for several years now. And by and large, I think it's gone very smoothly. And I think districts understand the need for it. And it tends to require districts to to take that appropriate long-range view because you don't have the ability to access the state's cost allowance any time uh, that the district desires, but limited to a five-year window. We've had districts in different scenarios whereby you may have construction cost allowance, but you used up your entire incidental allowance with a $10,000 project to do your site work on your sports fields and things of that nature. So we do look at them in individually, both the construction and the incidental cost allowance. So if you have no incidental cost allowance available, you're welcome to do a capital project with the understanding that all of the incidental costs, 100%, would be a local share. That's usually not an acceptable situation to districts, and therefore they would end up having to wait for the remainder of that five-year period until those costs rolled off on the back end. We had districts in the opposite situation where they have incidental costs remaining and no construction costs, and it's the same situation. They can choose to proceed if they want. It's generally not an acceptable situation to them. So keep, keep that in mind. Uh, we do um, look at that uh, both from a construction and an incidental perspective when we uh, review that multi-year cost allowance uh, calculation. Jurisdictional issues when leasing. Um, this has become more complicated recently, I will say, simply because, again, on the first bullet during school building consolidation, one of the reasons districts do this is not only because they can save operational costs like uh, you know, staffing, uh, heating, utilities, uh, maintenance, all those things. Uh, they also occasionally have an opportunity to lease that building out if they're saving it. If they're holding on to it, they have an opportunity to lease that building out and make some rental income, so to speak, on it. So uh, trying to look at this issue, um, there's been different court cases over the years, but uh, one view is that once it's no longer being leased for a school district purpose, you know, if you lease it to a different district or a BOCES, for example, that's a school district purpose, and certainly we still have jurisdiction. If you lease it out to, uh, you know, um, a professional office park, doctors, dentists, lawyers, whatever the case may be, um, that's in some circles considered no longer a public school purpose, and therefore, why should the State Education Department insert ourselves into a local jurisdictional issue? It might be an easy discussion when we're talking about doctor's offices or professional office or something like that. It might be completely different if 
the school building is in the residential area and for whatever reason it was a perfect location for you know Midas muffler or uh, um, you know a liquor store not that uh, any districts propose that at this point but those are the kinds of things that we look at and it's ne not necessarily appropriate for the state education department to be overriding the local jurisdiction for things like zoning uh, planning board uh, and things of that nature when districts are leasing to entities who are not educational entities. So if an entire building is leased out for a non-educational purpose, we are trying to coordinate with the local jurisdiction and have them take over jurisdiction in that facility until such time it's back in educational use. That can create problems that districts need to know about. If you take an educational occupancy, and lease it to an entity that converts it to a business occupancy or a mercantile occupancy or any other occupancy other than educational according to the code, then that entire building needs to be brought up to the code, the current code, for that purpose. And of course that would be a discussion between you and the lessee who's going to incur those costs and if the district incurred it then uh, the uh, cost presumably would be reimbursed through the lease and so forth. The thing to keep in mind is that when and if that building then comes back to district purposes for educational use, it is again a change in occupancy from the business occupancy back to the educational occupancy and must be brought up to the current code in effect at the time that it comes back to educational purposes. And that will be our jurisdiction again because it is then back in public school district control and for public school district use. So there are potentially significant costs involved when bringing something up to current code uh, because of occupancy change. There are other situations where you may be able to lease to an entity that does not cause an, an occupancy change, such as a private school or a nursery school or something along those lines. Emergency projects. Um, I don't know that there's any particular questions on these, but um, uh, there are a significant number of emergency projects that keep popping up, whether that's boilers in the wintertime or uh, you know, air conditioning for special uh, special ed or special populations during the school year or any number of things. And uh, our standard line, of course, is that it has to be a true emergency. You may very well have a local emergency that we do not agree is an emergency as defined by the state statute, and that is an unforeseen circumstance. So if you have a 40-year-old roof that leaks like a sieve and you got garbage cans everywhere catching water, that's not an emergency because clearly a 40-year roof is long past its useful life and should have been anticipated to uh, be replaced long before that. On the other hand, if you still have that 40-year-old roof and it's leaking like a sieve and the wind comes up and tears it off, that is unanticipated and that can be an emergency and will help you replace that roof in, in the following year. The other thing to keep in mind is that emergencies don't have voter authorization and therefore you have to scrounge up the cash in your budget to pay for it. That's not always an easy situation in today's economic times for school districts to do. So any questions on emergencies? please contact your project manager and we'll uh, evaluate that with you. There are a number of projects in here for $100,000 uh, cash uh, capital outlay projects and the only thing I wanted to mention here is that uh, we understand that there is a deadline to get this work done within a particular fiscal year and so if you have a project in here for 100000 capital outlay, let us know, contact your project manager and we will get that project approved as soon as possible. Uh, despite our backlog, we understand that uh, that money has to be spent by a particular deadline, June 30th of a particular year. Uh, and we briefly already talked about the appropriate long-range planning. Uh, I did not mention at the beginning, which I probably should have, we are experiencing a significant backlog. Oh, here it is. Um, we're at 26 weeks, which is literally six months, half a year. And uh, there's 750 projects here in the office. All I can advise is plan accordingly. As in years past, there will be a number of districts that simply will not get a building permit in time to be successful this summer. And that's extremely unfortunate. No one's happy about it. Certainly we're not. It puts everybody in a difficult position. But I will tell you that that's simply the best that we're going to be able to do uh, with our current resources and our, uh, and our staffing. So. Um, Absolutely, if your project was submitted right now, literally it's March 20th, and we are reviewing projects that were um, submitted in the first week in October. So for those of you who have submitted you know, in December, January, February, et cetera, uh, you're not going to be uh, uh, 
uh, building with a permit this summer. Project review status. Um, we still, for some reason, have a significant number of districts that submit all kinds of information without having any project number. And as you can imagine, with over 2,000 projects a year being reviewed and approved, and the thousands from previous years that are uh, being reviewed for change orders and addenda and certificates of substantial completion and final cost reports, et cetera, you must have an LOI in order to have a project number, and therefore you must put that project number on absolutely everything. Otherwise, it's uh, in all likelihood going to get misplaced in this office if we can't attach it to an appropriate file. Some common project management problems that you guys can help us with as uh, the, for the most part, the folks on this conference are, uh, are uh, business officials. And we certainly believe that business officials and districts in general need to take a very, very active role in all of your capital projects. Uh, one generic comment is that we still see many districts simply turning over the entire application process and package to their consultant. And uh, as a result, districts are not abreast of what's going on where it is, when it was submitted, and things of that nature. So we try to uh, keep districts in loop on that, but uh, the biggest issues can be avoided by taking an active role in your own projects. So we have a significant problem with incomplete or unsigned forms. Unfortunately, um, many of the paperwork still comes in without the appropriate signature on them in the spaces provided. Uh, whether it's just oversight or people are just so busy they're trying to get something in to meet a particular deadline or they want to get it in line, so to speak, in our review process, um, we're getting in incomplete documentation, which is certainly going to delay you. Insufficient and incomplete scope of work on the project description. We do have that detailed project description page, and we suggest that everyone use it so we can get a clear idea of what's included in the project. That may very well help it get expedited because, um, although we don't advertise it, uh, and uh, we're not advertising it, um, I absolutely do uh, encourage uh, our review staff, you know, when they've had a, a long week, so to speak, and they need to feel good about, uh, good about it on a Friday afternoon before they go home, they can pick up some quick projects and crank a, crank a half a dozen or more projects out uh, on Friday afternoon before they go home for the weekend. And if the project description is detailed enough so that it's clear that the work is relatively simple, replacement in kind, then um, in all likelihood, those projects can be uh, found and, and, uh, and uh, approved. And uh, unfortunately, we seem to have a significant issue with incorrect project numbers on documentation. So um, as you can imagine, that's going to create a, a significant hardship for all concerned when n not only, uh, in this case, the project number has been obtained, but when it's applied to the incorrect projects. Project managers are looking for certified vote tallies in appropriate budget section or referendum language, and it's not just um, Board of Education minutes. Those are appropriate for big four districts, uh, but not for all other districts. We have to have that absolute referendum language and the certified vote tally from the, for the project manager to be able to move forward with the project. Plans and specs books. Uh, this is longstanding guidance that uh, people tend to forget over time simply because I know there's a lot of change in the uh, in the ranks out there uh, um, as people move on, retire, uh, new folks coming in, et cetera. But again, with over 2,000 projects a year, the m easier you can make it on our end, uh, that will help the entire backlog move along. So identify and paperclip those things in the specification books for us so that it's easy to find, um, including the equivalency, the wage rates, the non-collusion, and uh, 155.5, which is safety during construction information. Another topic is standardization. It's becoming very uh, critical uh, just lately, and I'm not sure what the uh, what may have changed in the field to uh, cause this to be such a big issue at the moment, but it certainly has taken on a, a new life, so to speak. Um, but the bottom line is standardization is when a district wants to use a particular manufacturer or vendor or material on their project. You may have um, a number of school districts with that product in it, and you want to make sure that all your buildings are the same, or you have an existing system and you want to expand it. Therefore, you want the manufacturer who manufactured the existing one to um, provide the expansion so it's all one system. So 
standardization can be done in appropriate uh, locations provided that it's on a purchase contract only, not a public works project. A public works project is a project that is your typical capital project, and it must have free and open competition in the specifications. So yes, you can standardize on a purchase contract, and what that means is if I want to buy ABC boiler, then my Board of Education passes a standardization resolution to say that for the following reasons, we are going to standardize on ABC boiler, and then you purchase that boiler directly from the manufacturer, and you write a, a capital construction project to install the material and the product provided by the district. In that way, you can get standardization. You can get the project that you want, but you cannot limit competition within the capital project. So you can have the contractor install, but not purchase and install a standard product. Now, a we goes in parentheses. The reason for that is we may very well be changing our guidance on this based on the fact that we go Appalachian Central School District just had a open bid for a brand new elementary school for a project that was a building that was destroyed back in the Lee Hurricane uh, Tropical Storm Irene and Lee uh, 2000 I don't know 11 or 12 I believe and they're just uh, now being able to award those projects after going through their FEMA project FEMA uh, process to get federal state funding etc to replace the facility so they had a number of standardizations in the contract we uh, required them to rebid because we did not believe that that was appropriate and the low bidders sued, went to court and just got a Tioga County judge to say that that standardization was uh, okay in that case. So while I'm waiting to get that decision and send it to my counsel, uh, we're still saying that uh, standardization can only be done on a purchase contract, but stay tuned. We may be forced to change our guidance depending on how this decision plays out and what that particular judge had to say, whether whether we believe that this has a statewide implication or whether it was limited to this specific, specific case. So more to come on that. Uh, and other odds and ends are uh, we don't want separate specification books in, uh, for each trade or contract on a project. And in some cases, uh, you know, a construction manager might break down a project into 10 or more uh, individual contracts. I'm going to bid a, a roofing contract. I'm going to bid an insulation contract. I'm going to bid a masonry contract, and so on and so forth. And so we end up with 10 spec books and 10 uh, uh, general uh, general conditions and 10 of everything. That's not what we want. That just makes more paperwork for everyone. We don't care how you bid it, but just send us one set of combined documents. Uh, unless the second bullet, they're absolutely huge. On occasion, we get massive projects with you know two or three hundred drawings. You know, the, our support staff can't even move those around. So, <laughs> uh, be reasonable if they're just massive documents. Have your have your architect split them into several packages just so that they're capable of being handled. Other project managers' items: asbestos issue is um, has uh, seems to have reared its head again. The bottom line is we need both. Uh, the asbestos designer, designer and the architect of record to be one and the same. Not necessarily the architect of record. I, mi I misspoke there. The architect in our the asbestos designer must also be a licensed architect. They have to uh, have both licenses, and uh, that's uh, to make sure that uh, the architect, as uh, who designed the project. Um, he has to sign off on all, he or she has to sign off on all work in the project, and if they have no knowledge or skill of, of the work included as uh, based on the asbestos designer, then how can they properly sign off that that asbestos work is in compliance with the code, and therefore that's why we require the architect to have both the architectural license and the asbestos license. An addenda. Um, send the, uh, your agenda directly to your architectural and engineering reviewer. They are the folks who specifically ask the questions that they need the answer in order to move your project forward at that review point in time. So don't send that to the project manager. Just put directly the architect or engineer who is reviewing the project and made the comments, put their name on the cover sheet so that it can go directly to them, and I'll just save a little time trying to uh, sort through everything and get it to the right location. 
Uh, as we talk about addenda, how many is too many? Uh, this is something that facilities planning really, really struggles with. And uh, in a nutshell, um, there are times when my staff gets involved in a review that in most cases is, is fairly technical or complex, and we find errors and we issue uh, comments so that those things can be corrected. And the addenda comes back and there's still problems with the project, either they uh, didn't fully uh, respond to the comment or quite frankly sometimes comments are ignored or uh, the uh, addenda, their, their revised design in our opinion is still not compliant with the code, et cetera. And I encourage my staff where possible to reject the design go back to the architect and say, you know what, I'm not even going to review this now. It's not ready. Notify the school district so that you folks are, are aware of it. Uh, sometimes that's very difficult to do if they've spent a significant amount of time getting to the point where they're able to make those comments. Sometimes my staff feels like if I just tell them that it's rejected, then I'm going to have to review this whole thing all over again. That's a waste of my time. But on the other hand, when we start getting into six, seven, eight, 10, 12, 14 addenda to try and get a project approved, that's clearly inappropriate and we start having conversations with school districts about the quality of those documents and the submissions and uh, you folks in turn, we would hope, would have a conversation with your consultants about that. Uh, when addenda do get submitted, make it easy for us to understand what the changes are and this is information you know that we're trying to share with the field as well, but you can, uh, you can uh, understand the issues and, and encourage your architects to comply. Um, you know, if you have a significant number of changes on a drawing, cloud those changes so that it, it's easy for us to identify where the changes on the drawings are and which addenda comments they respond to. The SAFE Act for school funding. Uh, I think as most people know now, uh, there was a 10% funding incentive available if it is done uh, as a claim form process, and that is uh, both the facilities planning at the bottom of the page and the state aid unit have identified uh, documents on our website that can guide you through this process. And if you go through the claim form process, then you can get an additional 10% aid on your current aid ratio for projects that are uh, approvable for uh, safety and security, specifically electronic sec door security systems and, uh, excuse me, electronic security systems for front entrances and, and then uh, door hardening, which uh, can be any number of things. So um, we did try to limit the electronic security systems to front entrances. This is not an opportunity to get a full-blown security system, burglar system, uh, surveillance system. Um, it is appropriate to uh, secure the main entrances in uh, in relation to this act, but it was not an opportunity to do full-scale uh, security systems throughout the building and, uh, and uh, employee uh, swipe cards and, and ID systems and those kinds of things are not included. It was uh, intended to secure the facility itself from intruders, so uh, we tried to limit that to uh, entrances where you can uh, communicate, see someone, check an ID, for example, and then allow them into the building. Uh, if you do it as a capital project, you may very well get more aid than you would doing it on the claim form, depending on the district's uh, select aid ratio versus the current aid ratio. And we encourage districts to uh, look into that and figure out which method is more appropriate for you. Um, but certainly in the uh, desire to get things done sooner rather than later, if you are able to use the claim form process because your projects are uh, in compliance with those guidance documents that we put out, then it's a simple claim form through the state aid office and does not need to come through facilities planning for a building permit or a code review. Uh, and you can simply document those expenses to the state aid office, put down the name and license number of your architect so that we're confident that a professional did look at uh, what you proposed, and then simply get that reimbursement from the state aid unit in the following year. Uh, Architectural engineering. Uh, the bottom line is you folks are employing licensed professionals and you should be expecting professional work from them. Uh, this goes back to the comment also on the addenda, how many is too many when you start getting uh, 
professionals that are submitting documents multiple, multiple times to our office, you've got to have a heart-to-heart -heart with them and say, look, clearly uh, the State Education Department Office of Facilities Planning is not happy or not satisfied with the work that you're submitting to them on our behalf. That, as you can imagine, interferes with everybody down the line. Not only can't you get your project approved, but because we're spending so much time on your project, all the people in line behind you are also being further impacted by each project that has a difficult uh, set of comments or incomplete documents. And again, uh, don't ignore the architect engineering review comments. It's not uncommon uh, for us to say, uh, you know, we send out comments with 10 or 15 uh, issues that need to be addressed or resolved, and we only get half of them back. And uh, that, quite honestly, really surprises me. Uh, but it does happen on a regular basis, and uh, you know, obviously those comments that didn't get answered are simply going to come right back again as, as uh, outstanding comments because they've not been addressed. But there's really no excuse for that, and I don't really have a good handle on why it happens. I've talked to different firms about it, um, and you know, I generally get the answer that everybody's busy and things get missed. So certainly once we've gotten to the point where we've reviewed your project and have issued specific comments, I would think that would be the point in time where it would be appropriate not to be in too much of a hurry, but in fact answer the questions that we've asked. Uh, this sheet is really for the uh, architects, but uh, again, to share it with you to understand the types of problems and issues that we're facing. If the architects of record don't do a thorough in-house review uh, before they submit the documents to us, then uh, more problems exist than need to. And uh, this is just the first two ch pages of our code compliance checklist that your professional consultants fill out on our behalf. Pages one through six, this is just the first two. But uh, if they do a thorough review and take these documents seriously, they should be able to eliminate 99% of the uh, issues that we're going to need to address with them. 155.5 requirements, again, provide an exiting plan. All exits need to, re not all exits need to remain operational, but all code required exits need to remain operational. So if you need to close an, a required exit for a, some purpose for your construction project, you need to identify on the plans and specs where that alternate exit is going to be and how it still remains code compliant. And the architect has to work with the district in order to be able to accomplish that. They have to design those exits and you have to be able to manage your operations using those new exits. And so if you haven't communicated clearly about that, then uh, that's going to present difficulty during construction. You have to be involved in that. You have to understand what the architect's doing, and you've got to understand how that's going to impact your operations to understand that you can live with that issue during construction. We find that uh, in many cases that issue has not been addressed, and it presents a problem then during construction. Change orders. We are having a significant issue with change orders. Most of it results in the fact that, uh, from the fact that we have it, we do have a significant backlog. Uh, districts are wary of having to submit a new project because you're going to be subject to the backlog again. Um, you may have money left over because you have uh, bids that came in favorably. There could be any number of reasons. The bottom line is. The comptroller's opinion says that uh, for change orders uh, over $35,000, they need to be publicly bid. They need to uh, be looked at for um, adherence to the original contract, so to speak. So, you know, if you if you have a project for roofing and you do a, a $50,000 change order for a new uh, um, computer wiring, that's not appropriate, whether you have the money or not. Uh, is simply not appropriate. The project was for a roof. The change order work is not related to the original project and therefore should not have been done in this change order. And we will uh, provide a penalty if districts do that. First of all, if it's not bid, depending on the size and nature of the change order, we may apply it a 20% penalty. In other words, you would not get aid. The aidable portion of the change order would be reduced by 20% because that is a figure that has been demonstrated to uh, result in increased costs of approximately 20% when things are not competitively bid. So we'll provide that penalty. And then, of course, there are times when we simply won't pay aid on any of the change order because it was clearly inappropriate or 
uh, in several cases lately, it was clearly done to circumvent the existing laws. Uh, an example might be, uh, a real example might be that we had 10 change orders. You want to install a fence around the school property, and I got 10 change orders from point A to point B for 25,000, from point B to point C for 25,000, from point C to point D, et cetera so that each change order for the exact same purpose was broken down into a bite-sized piece that was presumed to be less than the 35000 therefore didn't have to be bid, but it was really very clear that the change orders were done that way in order to circumvent the law by doing a three hundred or $400,000 change order in small enough pieces that it was alleged to be within the public bid laws and so forth. Not the case, and we did not pay aid on any of that entire change order, not just a 20% penalty, but no aid. It was clearly inappropriate and should not have been undertaken. So if you have any questions on change orders, by all means, talk to your project manager. We'll help you wherever we can, but there will be times where we say, no, that's not appropriate. Sometimes it costs more money to do it right, and that's a real issue. And uh, we simply say to districts that that's the law, and that's the requirement for using public money, the public bid process and the public integrity. So if you choose to avoid that, um, that's going to be an issue that we're going to have a problem with. And of course, the simple answer is if you don't like the public money, don't want the public money, <laughs> then we can arrange to not, not provide any as well. So it is sometimes a difficult situation, um, but those are the requirements and the rules that we play under because we're public entities. Post-bid addenda. Again, this is a problem because uh, um, school districts are recognizing the backlog and uh, want to avoid it. But again, post-bid addenda may be appropriate if they are in keeping with the original contract and uh, and uh, some other things. So talk to us again on, as well on that before you simply just keep letting out more work on the same project just because you may have money available. School district needs to be involved in your design, of course, and we certainly hope this is the case, but we're occasionally running into situations where uh, school districts say, hey, what can we do? We got this thing built and it really doesn't suit our needs or serve our purpose. Well, uh, we're way past that by the time this thing is built or approved. And, uh, you know, that should have been avoided through an integrated design whereby the school district and the architect are really collaborating and designing the space that you need and you understand how it will be operated and used when it's done so that you can get the uh, things incorporated into the design that you need to operate it the way you anticipate. Energy performance contracts. Um, I will tell you that energy performance contracts continue to be the biggest single contributor to our backlog. There is a significant additional effort that needs to be undertaken for us to be able to review and approve them. They simply take a significant amount of time. We do have to look at all the formulas, the assumptions, the calculations, uh, whether building aid is appropriate, all those kinds of things. And um, we, uh, we have a lot of uh, time involved in it. And um, we've tried to address that by going to the third party review. It does cost the district more money. The state will pay aid on that third party review. And if you go to that effort, uh, we won't look at the, the uh, energy calculations and the payback analysis that's been done by a third party. We will limit our review to the code compliance as we do on other projects. Uh, we understand why districts uh, undertake them, but they are uh, very difficult uh, uh, contracts to review and approve. We always have uh, disagreements with uh, your ESCOs about energy calculations, baseline assumptions, uh, energy usage, and, and so forth. So they're, they're simply very, very complex, and each one appears to be different. We haven't found very many uh, coordinate, uh, um, very many energy performance uh, issues that seem to be the same from one project to another. Uh, building aid and warranties, certainly uh, we expect certain items to last particular useful life. We're looking at the bigger items in general, roofs, boilers, etc. If you have a 20-year roof and it only lasts 10 years, and then we're not going to pay aid on a new roof. On a new 20-year roof, we'll prorate that aid and cut it by half. Boilers, again, uh, should certainly last 20 years. Uh, so we're looking at those kinds of items. Roof coatings. 
uh, we put out a newsletter article uh, not too long ago that talks about the fact that the roofing vendors and the roofing manufacturers are actually coming to us and saying, you know, there's many, many times that public entities in particular, and, and school districts obviously are one of those, that do a complete ripoff and roof replacement when it's really not necessary. And of course, we'd all like to avoid that. That costs excess money that was not necessarily needing to be spent if that roof was not to the point where the whole thing needed to be ripped off. What we suggest instead is do a good investigation and find out where wet spots are, cut and remove those areas, build those roofs in those areas from the base up where they need to be, and then uh, do a lesser roof replacement on the remaining roof. Uh, that will save everyone a lot of money. It's certainly more green. It saves things from going in the landfill uh, and all those kinds of things. So it's an interesting issue that is actually being brought to us by the manufacturers and the vendors, which, you know, let's face it, they might have an interest in districts doing more complete and total ripoffs, but they're coming at it from the perspective that there's a significant amount of waste that's going into the landfill that just doesn't need to be, in, and uh, I think that's an appropriate uh, acknowledgement from the industry that, hey, let's try and, and do this right and prevent that waste. Security project issues. I guess this is a little bit out of uh, order, but um, um, if you're going to do uh, vestibules and security office additions and so forth, those are not simple claim form projects. They do need to come for a code review because you're adding space, you're adding doors, and things of that nature. Electronic locks, delayed egress is never allowed never allowed. Uh, in, <clears throat> in relation to security, we are seeing a lot more problems with districts putting devices on their doors to prevent them from latching. In general, they are illegal and they are not allowed. Popular ones seem to be the refrigerator magnet style, which just goes over the uh, latch receiver in a door frame. The, the classroom door is locked from the quarter side, and when the door is closed, the latch can't throw because the receiver is closed, covered by a magnet. If there is a, an alarm or a lockdown, then the teacher doesn't have to expose themselves in the hallway by locking the door. They simply pull the magnet out, and the latch uh, is seated in the receiver, and the door is already locked. Although we understand the concern of any device that overrides a life safety feature is illegal. So when you prevent a latch from being uh, received, then you have overridden the fire door. The fire doors are required to close and latch. That's why they have closers at the top of the door. You can't put a wedge in the door. Under the door, you can't put the broom handle in the hinge. You can't put a magnet over the latch receiver, et cetera. There are ways and there are new products that you can use to, to do this properly. You can lock doors from the inside without exposing yourself. There are new locks that have indicators on them. So if you are in the classroom and you see a red dot on the lock, you know that it's locked from the quarter side. So again, there are new products. There are ways to uh, deal with these security issues, but you can't use these uh, um, products which simply prevent life safety features from working the way they are intended. Uh, we we are doing a lot of electronic submissions, and our con, our vendor is Dataflow, and they can provide technical assistance. We've had some uh, issues there that uh, um, have been resolved, but uh, that is a useful system. We encourage districts and their consultants to use those. They have a good technical assistance unit. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this. Green Ribbon Schools, uh, this was the third year uh, that we did uh, green ribbons in accordance with the federal government nomination process. And uh, we had one elementary school this year, Ann Hutchinson in East Chester, which was recognized as a federal green ribbon school. So it's all about three pillars of environmental sustainability, education, uh, facilities, and, uh, and uh, I just lost the third one. Um, so in general, the whole uh, idea behind this is let's encourage the next generations to be more and more green, reduce our environmental impacts, improve our health and wellness, um, environmental education, and uh, sustainability of the environment. And our facilities can can uh, contribute significantly towards that. 
Annual visual inspections, and of course we're coming up on another building condition survey. The annual visual inspection portal is still open from 2013, so if you have not done your report, or if you haven't submitted your data, we'll still accept it. We want as much data as we can get. Um, and as I mentioned, the 2015 building condition survey is right around the corner. Uh, we will be doing the 2014 AVI, and then next year we'll do the building condition survey. You can incur building condition survey expenses in the 14-15 year or the 15-16 year and get reimbursed for those. So, of course, 1415 starts on July 1st, 2014. Um, so start talking to your consultants, your architects and engineers about scheduling your building condition survey for the next year. We would suggest you do it next summer uh, when it's close to, 2000, uh, to November 2015 as possible when the survey is due. Um, and, of course, once that survey is done, we'll expect you to update your five-year facilities plan. The only thing I would say is please take this opportunity seriously. We will be paying a significant amount of aid. We pay basically in the neighborhood of $25 million across the state every five years to allow you to get really, really good detailed data on the condition of your facilities. If you think you have a wet roof, get that x-ray done. It's a condition survey. Find out the condition of the roof, not just eh, it looks okay, I don't see any tears. If you have concerns, get a core drill, get an x-ray, find out if there's water penetration, find out if there's saturated insulation. If you have a heating system that one wing of the building is always cold, get the engineers in there to investigate why and then find out what needs to be done to correct it. Again, it's a condition survey. Don't just say the condition is this wing is always cold. Spend the money to find out why that's happening then your architects and engineers can design a solution for that problem. But the key is take the opportunity to get the data that you need to have informed decision making. Um, as happened every year, every building condition survey thus far, there's a, a bidding war that happens. And although the state will likely be reimbursing in the neighborhood of 27 cents a square foot on the building condition survey by 2015, we see surveys being done at three cents, four cents, five cents a square foot, and quite honestly, they're not worth the data that you receive. Take it seriously. Get the data you need. Get detailed and accurate data, and then you will be much farther ahead when it comes time to plan your next capital facilities project, and you'll have a better idea of what research needs to be done to put that project together. So uh, with that said, um, please take it seriously. It's a incredible opportunity. I work with people in my position on the national level uh, from other states and uh, other states, they're amazed at the money we're willing to spend just to help districts investigate the condition of their facilities. I understand that spending more per square foot does result in a higher local share and budgets are tight, but don't spend three cents a square foot just to comply with the data survey because it's simply not worth it. Our current fire safety system, as you know, is an annual inspection. It rotates through an 11-month cycle so that over the course of a decade, basically, districts' buildings get inspected at every month of the year, so you might find things that are wrong during one season that you might not notice in another. Uh, we're going to move this system to an electronic system, and we're going to uh, hopefully roll this out um, this, this uh, fall. Uh, so in the future, we've slowly been uh, changing the system such that it's more and more electronic, but uh, it's going to be all online now. In the future, if you have a clean fire inspection, the system will simply email the fire or the uh, certificate of occupancy back out. So stay tuned for that. Um, it's in development, and again, we hope to do that this fall. The electronic uh, submission with a superintendent verification. And I'm going to go through this because we're getting low on time. I want to have a couple of questions if necessary, or uh, carbon monoxide, or uh, if, if needed. Carbon monoxide, Chapter 543 of the Laws of 2013. I will be reaching out to your directors of facilities to talk about the various locations where they may need fire or uh, carbon monoxide detectors, and uh, we need to have a report 
to the legislature and the governor's office by July 31st of this summer. And with that information, presumably they will evaluate whether the need exists to, uh, to fund uh, carbon monoxide detectors uh, throughout schools as a mandate. Uh, certainly carbon monoxide detectors are eligible for aid now if a district chooses to install them in a capital project. This would be uh, potentially above and beyond that to mandate districts to do that in specific locations. Don't forget your required HERA notifications. Uh, uh, other issues are asbestos critical short-term worker notification. Whenever districts get inspected or evaluated or audited on their AHERA compliance, one of the things that's very commonly forgotten is you have short-term workers and you need to notify them and quote train them, provide them information on where asbestos may be in your facility. And that last bullet is very important. We've had a lot of situations where fiber, asbestos fibers were released because a short-term worker, meaning, hey, came in for a specific task. We hired a plumber to do this. We hired an electrician to run a, a wire there, whatever. Those folks were not notified that the asbestos was in that area, and therefore they cut something that resulted in the asbestos fiber release. Unfortunately, this is uh, the 60th anniversary of uh, Cheektowaga Cleveland Hill School District fire. Fifteen children were killed. We have a very good track record in New York, and we want to keep it that way, but this is the last significant uh, loss of life that we had in, uh, in our state. It was a single-story wood frame building, uh, coal furnace, wood frame, wood floors, wood doors, wood wainscoting, wood trusses, roof, wood roof over wood, wood, yes, wood roof boards over wood trusses, uh, combustible fiberboard ceiling. Uh, we wouldn't build this way now, and as a result, a lot of uh, fire safety regulations changed. We, have, we, we require notification to fire departments uh, and so forth. We require non-combustible building materials, even go so far as to require non-combustible furnishings. Uh, and so this is the current reason for many of the fire safety things that we have. The bottom line is, is that the fire originated in the teacher's workroom. Earlier that day, students had been painting props for the school play. Five-gallon paint cans were found. The fire spread from the teacher's workroom diagonally across to the music room. There were no rescue windows at that time, so students broke the windows with their teachers to try and get out. And because there were no fire doors and the doors were not closed with closers, when they broke those windows, that created a draft and literally sucked the fire right into the music room where the, all of the fatalities occurred. So we have changed things, things significantly since then, both in the state code and into, uh, and excuse me, and the commissioner's manual planning standards. But um, we all need to keep in mind that fires literally happen in New York State schools every single day and across the nation. Most of them are, fall, are very small and quickly and easily put out. You know, your typical trash can fires or your little vandal, vandalism acts, things of that nature. But we also have significant fires on occasion. We lost a building last year in Long Island. Uh, of course, out in Greece, there was a, a, the a Greece Central School District fire where somebody uh, threw a, basically a Molotov cocktail through a, a an administrative window. Uh, and we have uh, the fires where uh, improper materials were stored um, in uh, boiler rooms and things of that nature. So this is a very serious issue, and we ask districts to make sure that this is forefront in your uh, fire safety planning. Uh, just more information on before the fire versus after the fire. Uh, that's when the uh, two exits were ever, from every classroom were required, and that second exit is generally the rescue window. All right, and that's pretty much it. We're going to ask everyone to work cooperatively and uh, and uh, um, you know in a in a uh, manner that promotes effective and efficient learning for all students in New York State, while at the same time we're keeping healthy, safe, and comfortable school facilities. We have a newsletter. Uh, we try to put out. Uh, pertinent information. Look for that, sign up for it, and uh, we'll get everybody the information as soon as possible. That's it.
it's only a couple minutes left, so I'd be happy to answer any questions that may be out there. Great. Thank you very much, Carl. All right. If anyone has any questions, it looks like a majority of you, majority of you are using your computers to listen in. So uh, you'll have to use the uh, question and answer window or use the chat window. I will be monitoring that here. Let's see. We have a question. Is there a way for business officials to learn if the visual inspection has been entered on the system as required? Uh, yeah, we've had a problem, quite honestly, as you were obviously uh, realizing, with once you enter your data, there needs to be a, an acknowledgement that the data was received and uh, properly transmitted. And, and uh, this system, unfortunately, was uh, designed uh, in-house with uh, folks who are no longer here. <laughs> It's really what it amounts to, uh, you know, and, and as you know, with all the things going on out there, whether it's the Common Core or teacher evaluations or, you know, uh, testing and, and uh, evaluations and all those kinds of things, uh, facilities planning is not the highest priority when it comes to the department's IT resources. And so we are working on that to try and fix that for the future. Um, I'm hopeful that's going to happen, but currently, if you need to know whether or not that was submitted, uh, I'm going to ask you to simply contact your project manager, and they'll have to look it up and let you know. Okay, thank you. Uh, where can we find the incidental and construction cost allowances? I'm sorry, Matt. Yeah, that that broke up. I only okay. got half the question. Sorry. Where can we find the incidental and construction cost allowances? Okay. Uh, the incident. The question is, where can we find those cost allowances? Um, if you have a recent project and nothing has changed, then it will be very, very close to that previous calculation. If it's been a while since you've done a project, then uh, you're going to have to contact your project manager, and they will be able to identify that information for you. It's not posted on the web because it is dependent on the actual use of the building, the actual enrollment, and uh, the labor rate at the time uh, that you're contemplating the project. So we don't post them online simply because they do change based on the use of the building, based on the enrollment, based on the programs being provided, and uh, again, the, uh, the, the economy, so to speak, meaning that the uh, labor rate does fluctuate up and down depending on whether the economy is uh, zooming along or, or uh, slowing down. So if you have it from a previous project, then that'll be uh, close. And um, if you don't, then by, by all means, contact your project manager. OK, thank you. Um, how can we sign up for the electronic newsletter or email communications? Just send Laura Sar or myself an email. My email is currently on the screen, and Laura Sar is the same, L Sar S L S A H R, and the end is the same at mail.nyscd.gov. Laura Sar manages that email or that newsletter for me, and she'd be happy to put you on the list. So you can email either one of us. Great. Um, let's see here. Can the district pre-purchase long? lead items before a building permit is issued? Yes, they can. Um, and again, um, there are some uh, issues that you need to be aware of. I don't know that they're necessarily risks, but issues. So for example, um, I, I need to install boilers, and I know it's a long lead item, or unit ventilators is another common one, chillers. Uh, and so. I want that on site so that when my contract is approved and awarded, I can, I can simply install them. Uh, um, that can be done. Um, you need to follow your, your uh, appropriate uh, procurement policies because now it's not being procured through the public bid, but it's being procured directly by the district. So of course, if it's over $35,000, you are going to have to do your bid and all that. So beyond that, you need to make sure that you're public works contract is written in such a manner that the, it's clear that the contractor is going to install the equipment provided by the district. 
the potential risk that I advise districts is that you could get into a finger pointing situation when the project is done, contract is being signed off, something doesn't work properly. In most cases, the contractor is going to say, well, my work was just fine, and the problem is with the equipment that you, district, provided. So that's your problem. Uh, the district might say, of course, no, our equipment was brand new from the factory, and you must have done something when you signed it, when you installed it, and so you, it's your problem. So there's a problem with identifying the problem, debugging it, whose responsibility is it, et cetera. You can potentially address that in the contract by requiring the contractor as part of the specifications to inspect and to accept the equipment prior to its installation. And that may be by, for example, requiring the contractor to bring the manufacturer's representative for the equipment to the site to verify that there's nothing wrong with it, it's acceptable, and it meets the manufacturer's standard. And then, of course, you would want the manufacturer to supervise the startup of a complex piece of equipment like uh, an, an HVAC unit or a chiller or a boiler and so forth. So yes, you can do it. There are a couple of things you need to be aware of, but they can be managed in the specifications properly. All right, great. We're going to give you one last uh, chance to submit any questions. Please do so now. All right. Is an incidental cost, let's see, try this again here. Here's how it's worded. Is it an incidental cost then versus constant construction? Um, no. The the uh, I assume this is, goes back to the previous question. Just because the district may purchase it directly does not mean it's an incidental cost. If it is appropriate construction cost that gets incorporated into the work, then it can still be listed as a construction cost. It was simply purchased directly by the district as opposed to being purchased through the construction contract. But it can still be included as a capital as a construction cost if it's a you know a piece of equipment permanently installed in the work and appropriate for construction. It can still be a construction cost. Yes. All right. Next question is: What if you want to standardize a proprietary system? Sorry, Matt, you broke up again. Sorry, I, I have a cold. <laughs> uh, what if you want to standardize a proprietary system? All right. Uh, proprietize, pri excuse me, standardize on a proprietary system. Again, yes, you can do that, as we talked about in one of the earlier slides, if it is done through a purchase contract. You can purchase that proprietary system through a standardization resolution and a purchase contract, and then turn that system over to the contractor to be installed. That results in the same potential risk that we just talked about on the boiler. You know, to avoid the finger pointing, you can make sure that the contractor in the specification is required to take ownership, so to speak, to accept that system as appropriate uh, and not undamaged, if you will, prior to installation. You can do that, uh, and again, We'll put out in a newsletter in the future if that guidance will change based on the OEGO situation in a recent court decision. All right, thank you. Uh, we have no other questions, so one more time. If anyone has any questions, please feel free to send them in right now. All right. We have no other questions. So, uh, Carl, thank you very much for being here. For everyone still on the line, thank you for coming. Uh, the next uh, webinar in this series will be on the third Thursday in April, which happens to be the 18th. The, uh, we're still coming up with a topic for that, trying to get that from uh, Chuck Sabrilla, so be on the lookout. Um, I did email you copies of the slides at 3 p.m. If anyone hasn't uh, gotten those, please email me. And I will be posting a video to this to our website here as soon as I got it, uh, as soon as I finish uh, 
converting up on you. Again, thank you all for being here. Carl, thank you, and we'll see you all in a couple weeks.